Good morning or afternoon. My name is Janie Montblanc and on behalf of the Great Basin Fire Science Exchange, the Native Plant Project and our partners, I would like to welcome you to this webinar titled Producing Native Plant Materials for Restoration, 10 Rules to Collect and Maintain Genetic Diversity, presented by Andrea Kramer with the Chicago Botanic Garden. Before I introduce our speaker, I will go over some webinar details. If you have questions for the speaker or me, please type them into the questions pane of your control panel located at the top right of your screen at any time during the webinar. I will field the questions for the presenter after the presentation, but it helps to receive questions throughout the webinar so that we have some ready in the queue. I also want to let you know that whatever you do in your control panel does not affect the webinar presentation, so you're welcome to type a test message or test your audio at any time during the webinar. If you're having problems with your audio, please open your audio pane and check your audio selections. Now I would like to introduce our presenter. Andrea Kramer received her bachelor's degree from McAllister College in St. Paul, Minnesota, and her doctorate from the University of Illinois at Chicago. She is a conservation scientist at the Chicago Botanic Garden and an adjunct assistant professor at Northwestern University, where she teaches and mentors students through the graduate program in plant biology and conservation. Her research interests include ecological genetics and its applications to native plant materials development and ecological restoration. Welcome, Andrea, and thank you for presenting today. Thank you. All right, I am now going to make you the presenter. Okay. All right. Hopefully, can you see everything? Yep, I see your title slide. Okay, great. So thanks everyone for joining in this, sorry, I'm just trying to get rid of the... Oh, the little control panel thing? Yes. You can <laughs> click that um, at the top left of your control panel as an orange box with a white arrow. Um, if you press okay. that, it'll minimize, yeah. Thank you. Oh, so that's, okay, great. <laughs> thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, the title of my talk is Producing Native Plant Materials for Restoration, and uh, We've tried to come up with 10 rules to collect, to follow, to collect and maintain genetic diversity. And I will just point out right from the start that this, I am giving the talk, but uh, this, this concept was developed with my colleague Jeremy Fant here at Chicago Botanic Garden and our graduate student Adrienne Basie, who recently defended her master's thesis and is now back in home in Portland. So, the, the talk is really based on a paper that came out in Native Plants Journal last spring with the same title. Um, and I'm really excited to be a part of this webinar series because I think the, the approach that we've been able to outline and try to distill down some very um, large um, population genetic ideas can be really useful as we all work to identify ways to help implement the National Seed Strategy for Rehabilitation and Restoration, so making sure that we've got um, adequate supplies of genetically diverse and appropriate seed for restoration is what this is all about. All right, so with that background, I uh, wanted to start with a bigger picture about why genetic diversity is important when producing plant material for restoration. So. We know from a lot of great research that in natural po plant populations, genetic diversity often equals things like greater establishment success, resistance to pests and pathogens, a more likely recovery after disturbance or climatic extremes like drought, um, as well as a greater potential to adapt to changing conditions, certainly important as we're talking more and more about climate change and trying to future-proof the populations we're restoring. Um, also, things like greater productivity, retaining nutrients, and also supporting, supporting more diverse and abundant um, wildlife communities. So those are all great things. Um, we also know that in the quest to produce enough plant material to do the restorations that we want and need to do, 
Um, we know that the traditional approaches to developing and producing plants are really based upon uses for agriculture and horticulture that emphasize uniformity, um, which is fine for uh, crop or horticultural species because we have management practices we can use to help them cope with extreme weather, fertility problems, disease issues. Um, these plants are not uh, taken out of their more cushy growing environments and put into natural environments and expected to um, survive and adapt and grow over time. So that obviously presents lots of great challenges and opportunities to merge the technique, merge these ideas of maintaining genetic diversity with the traditional approaches of actually producing the material that we need um, to to get these genetically diverse materials, knowing that producing them is very challenging with potential for loss at literally every step of production. So what we did in trying to outline these 10 rules was first try to identify um, as clearly as possible the many different steps that may be undertaken in native plant material production. So you can see the, the figure here uh, each of the gray blocks represents an action in the production process. You can see starting at the top, procuring the raw material that you need to be able to produce the material that you want for restoration and going through things like site selection, seed collection, seed cleaning, seed storage. And then once you've got the seed from your raw material, making a decision about how to actually implement it into the restoration or revegetation work that you're doing, whether, whether that's directly sowing wild material, whether or not that's um, producing live material that then will be planted out into the restoration, or um, whether or not that involves producing seed through more cultivate, through cultivation. And as you can see here, um, as you go from left to right, there's an increasing risk of genetic change in your seed material and, and genetic loss or in the material that you're producing. So that's our, this is what the structure that I'll use to, to go throughout the presentation. And then the circles that are connected with each gray box or each action represent the 10 rules that we've developed or that we've outlined um, to minimize genetic loss and change at each step. So I'll go through the rules in sequential order and we'll just revisit this process along the way. So starting with site selection and procuring your raw material on site selection is obviously really important. And for each rule, what I'm going to do is identify the, just like lay out the rule for you and then explain why that rule is important, and then in many cases provide an example as well as direct applications um, of those rules. And the, the paper that this is all coming from has lots of great citations and more justification and examples um, as well. So I'm happy to provide that um, if anyone wants that at the end of the presentation. Okay, so rule one, making sure that you identify sources that have conditions similar to the restoration sites that you either know you want to work with or that you may be using um, your material in. And this is, of course, because plant material is more likely to establish and persist if its genetic diversity matches that of the site conditions. Uh, and I've, I've got a few tools kind of after this that will help um, explain this, but um, for now, we'll just focus on the application, um, making sure that you're collecting from sites with environmental conditions that are similar to your restoration site. And we know that that can be defined in many different ways. Um, so it's just a broad guidance. Um, but then making use of established seed transfer zones when possible this is an obvious one. Um, but then also making sure that when you're selecting sites to collect seed from for restoration, making sure you're not just going to the easiest site to get to, but also not avoiding the sites that may not be particularly pretty 
don't avoid the ugly sights or avoid collecting during extreme conditions or at sites experiencing a bad year, they may have the genetic diversity that would actually be very useful for your restoration. Um, also making sure that you're not collecting from sites where the target species has been included in previous restoration work unless you're very confident that the genetic diversity that was used was not narrowed or altered um, from what you would intend to be able to get from that site. And then always, always, always keeping detailed location information for each collection. So I'm not going to go really deeply into this because last week's webinar did a fantastic job of laying out how you can actually select sites for um, restoration sourcing. So Holly Prendeville, um, her presentation is up on YouTube. The link is right up here. But really what she did was outline um, not only the reasons why it's important to get genetically appropriate plant materials for restoration sites, um, but some of the tools that are available, including provisional seed zones, as well as the empirically de defined seed zones that have been created for a, number, a growing number of species. There's another tool that I wanted to, to bring up that um, some of the, some, those of you involved with the Colorado Plateau Native Plant Program may be familiar with, um, but I just wanted to provide a little more detail. This was uh, a, a project or a tool developed by Troy Wood, um, who's the research lead for the Colorado Plateau Program with USGS. Um, and what they've done is develop a, a climate similarity index tool that's designed to help guide uh, development, evaluation, and use of seed for restoration. So this figure here shows a hypothetical species. Um, the top left figure that has just one color in it shows one accession and the entire distribution of the species um, throughout the western U.S. And if you have only one accession available to use for restoration, then you kind of are, um, your hands may be tied and you may need to use that individual source for restoration wherever the species is occurring. Um, but the tool that they've developed uses clim climate similarity to look at increasing, increasingly different climate areas within a species distribution to identify the, the best area to use an accession from specific sites um, for restoration. And you can see here they've just got an example um, if you have two accessions, then you have uh, two different colors that can help guide where you would use um, seeds produced from either of those accessions, and you can kind of go through um, multiple different potential scenarios. So they've developed this approach as well as a, a web app that's in development um, and available for testing um, if anyone is interested. They've also submitted a paper which is where this figure comes from, to ecological applications, and are more than happy to talk about um, any of using any of these tools for those of you that are trying to um, identify sources for new plant material development, prioritizing seed collection for both conservation and evaluation. This is how the Colorado Plateau prioritized their SOS collections um, for making additional collections for individual species to make sure they were covering as much of the climate space as they possibly could for each species. Um, and then it's also um, really, they're hoping, can be a really useful tool for ranking the climate similarity of seed that's available um, to use in restoration. So that is all that I will say about that, but um, please contact Troy or Kyle with any questions. Okay, moving on to rule two, we've got uh, collecting from sites with large populations in terms of when you're selecting your site, um, focusing whenever possible on populations that are, are larger, not only because they generally tend to have more genetic diversity, but also because they'll be less impacted by the seed collecting that you may be doing. So this is just an example from a, a native thistle here in the Midwest. 
that nicely illustrates this pattern. So the graph shows the number of plants in the population across the bottom for populations that have fewer than 100 individuals. The genetic diversity of just general genetic diversity in that population is relatively low and it significantly increases with um, increasing population size. So really an application of this is once you've got your priority population or populations, prefer preferentially selecting sites that are largest. So ideally larger than 100 um, or especially ideally larger than 1,000 individuals. And then of course making sure that in the process wild populations are not harmed, making sure that the landowners know of your collections, securing appropriate permits, um, and ensuring that you're not over collecting. So uh, there are a number of guidelines outlining what it means to over collect a species. Um, the Seeds of Success program has outlined some really great general guidelines for site selection and seed collection and uh, one of their mandates is not to collect more than 20% of available seeds at any given time and that's a nice, fairly universally and universally appropriate, um, well not universally, but a good approach for ensuring that you're not harming a population. And then also not collecting every year. Um, there are a number of publications that have tried to identify which species may be more vulnerable to over collections as well as which ones are not, so this doesn't have to be so much of a concern. Um, but in general, those that are most vulnerable are those that are not clonal and that are already found in fairly low abundances and or already under stress like pests or droughts. So this often translates into um, some of the greatest vulnerable, most vulnerable species being those of short-lived forbs. And uh, an example that was recently published from Tallgrass Prairies shows this nicely. So this figure um, that was published in Restoration Ecology last year um, shows uh, the number of species that are present in the prairie. Um, in an unharvested prairie, we've got more than 70 species. In a prairie that's infrequently harvested, which is um, harvesting but not more than once every three years, and then a frequently harvested prairie, which is almost every year. And you can see that you start to lose species when frequent harvesting is happening. And I've just pulled a few examples here. Um, the meadow blazing star was one of those species that was impacted by all harvest frequencies. And the Virginia mountain mint was impacted by harvesting every three years or more. Um, so Unfortunately, there aren't any hard and fast rules around this, but the more you know about your species biology, the more you can get at how impacted that population or species may be by different amounts and um, times of collecting the seed. Okay, so Moving down the process from site selection through seed collection and rule number three, um, we've termed this leaving no genetic stone unturned because uh, once we've selected a site that has a lot of genetic diversity, we want to make sure that you're actually co collecting as much of it as possible um, for your collection that will then go into production. So this graph just shows uh, the number of unrelated plants that you might collect in your collection, so ranging from 5 to 50 here, um, against the probability of capturing the most common genes in that population. So what this shows is that at 30 individuals, you're getting 95% of the common genes in that population. Um, this, me this is basically based on theory for species that are completely outcrossing. So if you're working with a species that is not outcrossing, that really does a lot of selfing, 
you're going to need to get as many as double that number just to capture 95% of the most common genes in the population. So basically, uh, 30 is really a bare minimum. Every additional individual that you collect from will increase the genetic diversity that you're able to include in your sample. And uh, the application of this, and this is uh, supported by, or this is also implemented by the Seas of Success technical uh, protocols, um, making sure that you're collecting mature seeds from at least 50 unique plants from each population, because it's really hard to tell when you're actually getting a unique plant. Um, a lot of them may be very related to each other or clones, so it's hard to tell where one plant starts and one plant stops. Um, so for this, I'm generally trying not to collect from plants that are growing next to each other because they're more likely to be related. Um, also, not avoiding plants that look different in your population just because they're small doesn't mean that that genetic diversity is not useful. Um, also, collecting multiple times to capture those earlier late flowering plants, um, also recognizing that genetic Genetic diversity may be spread throughout the, the flowering season. And then, particularly if your plant population is, is spread across a very large site, don't, don't just collect the plants that are easy to get. Um, scouting throughout the site to get plants from all of the different microhabitats that they may be occupying can help you ensure that you're getting all of the potential genetic diversity at that site. And then, if you're collecting from a lot of individuals uh, collecting roughly similar numbers of seeds from each individual whenever possible, just so your collection doesn't represent, you know, 90% of the seed coming from one plant and the other 10% being made up of seed from the other 30 individuals. That's a very unequalized representation there. And then as you're collecting multiple populations for the same species, um, trying to maintain the same sort of collecting strategy for all populations. All right, moving on to seed cleaning. So the genetic diversity you just collected is not lost. Uh, pre we're preventing the loss of viable seeds during cleaning. This is obviously important because unintentionally or intentionally removing seeds can lead to loss of genetic diversity. So a really cool example from this 1979 paper um, on Douglas fir showed that uh, basically they, they removed one third of the seeds from this bolt collection of 18 Doug fir trees. And by removing that lightest one third of seeds, which is often um, easy to do in the cleaning process, they ended up eliminating the majority of seeds from six trees. And so that's obviously uh, a reduction in genetic diversity that, that you probably would not want in your seed lot, um, particularly when they looked more closely. The six trees that were most often removed also happened to produce some of the tallest saplings. So a great example um, around why making sure we don't lose seeds from either the largest or the smallest ends of the spectrum can be very useful uh, in application, making sure that the cleaning equipment or settings that you use lets as much through as possible. Obviously, you want to separate the good seeds from the chaff. Um, as you do that, making sure you examine the chaff to see if any smaller but viable seeds are actually unintentionally being culled out. And if they have, then finding a way to retrieve those small, more viable seeds. And then recognizing that seeds from different seed lots, um, both different individuals and different seed lots, um, may be very different sizes or even just slightly different sizes, which means that modifying your cleaning protocols for each species and collection year may be necessary. It's not necessarily a one-size-fits-all cleaning strategy for the species. And then when it comes to seed storage, we obviously don't want to lose 
um, lose seed that represents genetic diversity through the storage process. So using optimal storage conditions is the recommendation, um, recognizing that um, this can vary greatly by species. Um, but in application, in general, for the orthodox species that we're working with, dry, cold conditions are going to be best. Um, we've included the rule of thumb that a lot of folks are working with, that storage temperature plus relative humidity should be less than 100. Um, this is fine for seed that's not stored for very long. Obviously, if you want to be able to store seed and maintain viability over longer periods of time, drying that seed down and keeping it cold or even frozen is usually the best way to get the, the best viability for the longest period of time. So it really depends on how you're using the seeds. If you're making a conservation collection, um, you may need to go that extra step to maintain viability. And then just not storing seeds longer than necessary and uh, making sure that you're storing seeds from different populations separately so you can track and manage different losses in viability over time. Okay, so now moving on from actually procuring the raw material to doing, doing plant production. Um, so I'm going to focus in on uh, either propagating plants into tubes or pots um, if you're producing live material or establishing a production field um, and a number of rules that really fit within that to maintain gen as much genetic diversity as possible. So we'll start with rule six, making sure that seed germination conditions are diversified. So we don't have seeds that aren't germinating that represent a loss of genetic diversity. So the example that we used for this comes from Henstam and Pachyphilus. Um, we did a number of germination trials with different populations and individuals of this species a few years ago. And this just highlights the importance of uh, diversifying your seed germination conditions. So the graph shows the number of days to germination across the bottom. And then we have three parent plants, all from the same population, um, all collected at the same time, but maintained individually. And when we went to germinate that seed, what we found were some really very different signatures about when the seed started germinating, when its average germination time was, and how big the spread was. So you can see that from parent plant C, it started germinating really early. It was you know, at 50%, around 60 days to germination. It was done by day 70. Whereas from pl plant A, parent plant A, it was much slower to start germinating and had a very narrow window of germination. And the, the dotted lines at one and two just represent potential times where you might, if you had thrown bulk seed for these three individuals into a flat, you may say, well, I'm just going to take whatever's germinated at day 60. You would actually only be getting representation from one individual instead of the three that you thought you were getting. Um, and likewise, if you were to do it later, um, at 80, day 80, you would still just be getting two. There's no single day of sort of selection that would give you all three plants. And of course, this can be important because the bigger the plant is, when, you, when it comes time to either growing them up for um, restoration or for putting into a production field, bigger plants often um, take precedence. And so those, those, pl those plants that took longer to germinate and maybe smaller at the time that you're installing something um, can be very challenging to, to manage that. So the application that we have come up with is that certainly sowing different populations separately because we saw these differences within one population, um, but the likelihood of differences between populations is even greater. Uh, using germination conditions that really just maximize germination of as much seed as possible, making sure you're not favoring those 
germinate faster or under certain conditions. And then um, whenever possible, keeping your germination flats for as long as possible, uh, even considering multiple cycles of stratification, depending upon how um, what your facilities are like and how important it is to try to get as much genetic diversity as possible out of your sample. All right, so continuing on through, through rule seven, lessening the impacts of plant maintenance. Once you've got your um, plants in their pots or in the fields, using growing conditions that make sure that you don't lose individuals or populations along the way. So um, that may require modifying conditions like light, water, nutrients, soil type, pest control, um, anything you can do to keep as many plants alive as possible is great. Um, if you keep your plant populations separate through this process, it's a lot easier to see if some populations may be faring better or worse than others and modifying conditions for that population as needed. Um, and then over time, making sure that you don't continue to use production beds if plant loss is high. Um, it can sometimes be very difficult to see if plant loss is high if you have species that have clonal growth or that are self-sowing because it can really obscure those, those losses. So again, doing what you can to keep populations separate and trying to keep a handle on the level of clonality and self-sowing that you've got, um, as well as just death of those original plants in your, in your plots. And along those lines, um, working to minimize unintended hybridization, um, both uh, between populations as well as between species, because this can obviously lead to changes in genetic, unwanted or wanted changes in genetic diversity. And this is, of course, um, easier said than done for species that are outcrossing. For self-pollinating species, this is really not a concern if they're exclusively self-pollinating. Um, but for those species like animal-pollinated species um, and when pollinated species, it's important to, to really consider this either by using temporal isolation, just not having them going in the field at the same time, or maybe the populations flower at different times anyhow, and so they'll be able to self-separate themselves, um, or also looking at spatial separation. And it really depends, of course, on the species again, um, and who is doing the pollinating, but for animal pollinated species, uh, separation of at least 100 meters um, or more for hummingbird pollinated species that really tend to move things around a lot can be at least initially effective, and for wind-pollinated species, um, having a, a greater separation and or using hedgerows to um, minimize the movement of wind from one of the seed, one seed lot to another. So an example that we've been working with here recently with some, some great collaborators in Washington and Oregon comes from uh, Castilea levisecta, the species of the yellow flowered um, Indian paintbrush species on the left, and Castilea hispida um, on the right, which generally has red flowers. So these two species have not very frequently been in common in natural populations, but uh, reintroduction efforts for the yellow flowered species are taking place because it is a federally threatened species. And there's another federally threatened species, the Taylor's checker spot butterfly, um, that uses Castilea hispida, the red flower species, as its larval host. So lots of reintroduction and restoration of both the yellow and red flower species is happening and bringing the species together, both in nurseries as well as in restoration sites, um, particularly in Oregon, where they haven't been together before, or at least in a very long time. So what we're seeing is hybridization between the species, um, 
that is definitely a cause for concern, particularly for the, the yellow flower species, the federally threatened species. Um, so there's a lot of ongoing research now. Um, we know that it, the, the uh, hybridization between species is happening. Um, we're trying to figure out when it's most likely and how to manage it in production and restoration. I'm working with the folks who've been working with these species for a long time at the Institute for Applied Ecology and University of Washington. We're just trying to help track um, how genes are moving and see if we can find ways to, to keep that from happening in these different environments. So then looking at Rule 9, um, still under the, under the subject of maintaining genetic diversity through production, Varying the timing of seed harvest once you've got plants in the field, using methods to maximize the number of plants that are represented, um, and make, definitely making sure that the earlier late flowering species or individuals are not left out of the seed collection that comes from that. So uh, this again varies depending on the species, um, and there are a lot of growers that are doing really cool work trying to make sure that they're capturing all of this diversity in production fields, um, but really including harvesting seed at peak maturity and, if possible, multiple times, but really using modified harvesting techniques depending on the population or species that you're working with, and uh, really just having to get to know the species and how it's performing in the field uh, much better to be able to, to do this effectively. Okay, which brings us to Rule 10, which you can see is kind of sticking out here in the, in the cultivated um, section, which really represents what happens when you produce a, a field of cultivated seed um, and run it through for multiple generations. So really wanting to be sure that the number of generations that something is produced in the field um, is, is limited. And this is really because genetic loss and change, particularly adaptation to cultivation, can occur in just one generation, especially if you're working with small numbers of plants in your fields. Um, and this may lead to plant material that's poorly suited to restoration conditions. So I've got a picture of Helianthus annuus here. It's a, there's some really interesting research showing how um, weedy populations growing on the margins of agricultural fields have actually adapted to this more cultivated situation and they've lost genetic diversity. They've also lost their ability to tolerate drought and fungal attack as well as just being more palatable to insects because they're in a field that's where those conditions are managed much more effectively um, relative to populations that are exposed to all of the elements and, and not coddled. So just kind of a cool example of um, how adaptation to cultivation can happen and why we don't want that to happen with the plant material that we're producing for restoration. And I mentioned that um, adaptation to cultivation can more likely occur in small populations. This graph just shows kind of why that's the case or how that's the case. It shows uh, the number of generations from 0 to 10 across the bottom, and then the percent of original genetic diversity that's maintained over that time. So everybody starts out at generation 0 or generation 1 um, with 100% of its genetic diversity. If you have a population with, 100, with 1,000 individuals, over time there's much less likelihood of losing that original genetic diversity. That's that top line. But as you get to smaller and smaller numbers, so a population with 100 or 50 individuals will start just randomly losing genetic diversity over time. Um, 10 individuals go very rapidly. Um, and this is just random loss. It doesn't have anything. Um, it doesn't illustrate what can happen if you've actually got selection happening um, to, 
change the genetic diversity like in the in the sunflower example that I just mentioned. So the application for this is ideally using only wild collected material when developing production beds or producing plant material in your nursery, um, limiting the number of generations when it is produced in cultivation and using large sample size and minimizing unintended selection throughout the process. So that's the 10 rules and got a little bit of time left. I wanted to provide a little more detail about some of the work that's been done on this on Castilea levisecta and why um, some of the work that Adrienne Basie has done for her master's thesis has shown that it's, it's a pretty cool success story of how when you when you look at the entire production process and work work to maintain genetic diversity, you, you can be successful at it. So this species has been under investigation for a number of years. Um, the Institute for Applied Ecology did a lot of great work showing that in natural populations, it had low genetic diversity and was often inbred. So the seed that was produced, there wasn't a lot of seed produced and that, what, that seed that was produced was not necessarily the most robust. So their research supported mixing four of the remaining populations um, to produce genetically diverse seed for reintroduction efforts. And they have very ambitious reintroduction efforts um, that meant producing large quantities of seed in a um, more commercially or in a much in a in a production setting. So uh, what Adrian did was take sorry I'll go back was take material um, from the plants that were used throughout this process to try to identify where genetic diversity may have been lost or not um, throughout the process. So this figure represents the four wild populations that I mentioned that um, research showed would be appropriate to mix in a production setting in order to make sure that the seed that was produced for a reintroduction was genetically diverse and also not inbred. So N, R, E, and C populations all had relatively distinct genetic fingerprints when they were looked at one when we used some molecular tools to look at them, but they also had pretty similar traits, so it was okay to, to mix them. Um, and you can see the four different colors for N, R, E, and C just represent those slightly different genetic fingerprints, which was really convenient. So we can follow those four populations through the production process. So basically what happened was the seed was wild collected from those populations, it was planted in nursery production beds. Um, this is a, uh, this represents the production beds at the Oregon Plant Materials Center where um, those four populations were grown. And when we ran the genetic analysis on it, we showed that um, they, did a, they did a good job of maintaining genetic diversity um, and genetic identity through that first step. So. Um, the N population looks very similar to the NS population, which is really basically the, uh, the production version of the wild population. And uh, what they did was establish nursery beds for each of these populations next to each other, but they maintained them as separate rows. So the populations were allowed to mix, but they were also able to track who was surviving and who wasn't. So they could hopefully get a genetically diverse product to use in their reintroductions. So we were also able to get material that had been used in the reintroductions over the last five years or so and um, basically showed that the material that they used in the reintroductions was nice and genetically diverse as they intended. So you can see the four colors that represent the four populations was nicely mixed throughout each reintroduction, regardless of whether or not they used plugs or seeds. Um, and I'll just note that the really dark 
blue colored population, the RS population. Um, they had planted fewer of those plants because it was slightly farther away than the others and they, they knew they wanted the genetic diversity but they didn't want it to overwhelm their seed sources. So they, they actually were able to get a nice ratio of that population relative to the others. So that's one nice um, process. And at the same time, those four populations were sown all together in a nursery, Webster nursery. Um, they were not maintained separately. They were basically the four populations, the seed was bulked and put out into nursery production beds. And you can see here that uh, the plants that survived at least a few years after the planting were relatively representative of the four populations, but that N population, the slightly the kind of cream colored population, there weren't many or really any plants that were still present, at least in that part of the field that we sampled. So um, one instant bottle, not instant, but one obvious bottleneck um, in the production process for that, that nursery. And then when we look at how the material that was produced through that nursery looked in reintroductions, um, this was, these were three reintroductions that used seed from that nursery. We can see that that dark blue population, the R population, was actually really, really overrepresented in the TQ reintroduction and the WH reintroduction, um, whereas it was really not represented in the other. And these were all done in the same year. These reintroductions were all performed in the same year, so we're not really able to pinpoint why genetic diversity was different, and in some cases lower in different uh, reintroduction sites. Um, because we just really can't trace things back because the populations were not sown separately. So kind of an example of how different approaches to developing nursery beds can really change some of the outcomes that you might see in your restoration or reintroduction sites. All right, and then just wrapping up with some other important points. So the rules that we've laid out here, as I've been pointing out along the way, are really just intended to serve as a general roadmap. They're not all going to be appropriate or even feasible in all circumstances. And really, because each species can be so unique, um, application and prioritization is really best handled by the land manager, seed producer, or plant propagator that's really familiar with the species. So, we want it to be a roadmap, but um, obviously it needs to be very flexible. Um, and these guidelines are not intended for the entire collection and production process for threatened and endangered plant species. The Center for Plant Conservation, for those of you working with species that fall into this category, have very, very detailed um, guidelines to follow for that. So we were really more focused on species that are more common and used in larger scale restoration. And as I've mentioned, not underestimating the value of record keeping, not only on where the population, the source population came from, but also on which populations, if any, were mixed, when and where they were grown, and the number of generations and cultivations, so we can follow things back if something goes awry, and also so uh, you know what material may be most useful in different sites. And really, in general, um, the need for more studies to help pinpoint where bottlenecks are happening for different species, I think would be really useful um, so we can figure out how to effectively but also affordably avoid them, which rules are more important in which situations. Um, those are all things that we still need more work on. And there are a lot of additional resources on this subject. Um, for the threatened and endangered species, there's a book that covers a lot of it, and uh, the Forest Service, as well as lots of other resources, um, both in the Native Plants Journal and other restoration journals, are incredibly useful. So 
Um, if you have any questions about those, I'm happy to provide more. And they're also listed in the in the paper. And with that, I think I've got about 10 minutes for questions or so. And happy to answer anything now or over email after the talk. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Andrea. The first question is from Owen Bauman, and he asks, could you clarify if the seed storage rule of thumb that suggests less than 100 for temperature plus relative humidity per percent uses Fahrenheit or Celsius? <laughs> Good question. It uses Fahrenheit. Great. Thanks. Next question, Scott Jensen asks, uh, Andrea, can you speak to the issue of how the dieparity and environments between seed increase fields and where our target species naturally occur? How do we minimize potential genetic impacts? Sorry, can you read that one again? Sure. Can you speak to the issue of how the, and I don't know if I'm saying this word right, dieparity and environments between seed increase fields? and where our target species naturally occur. Uh, maybe disparity between oh, the two? Oh, probably disparity. I thought it was this like cool, hip, <laughs> sciencey word that I didn't know. It's probably. It maybe, but I don't know it either. <laughs> <laughs> so, that was Scott, that's a really, that's a really good question and a really good point. So, the likelihood of of a seed lot adapting to its cultivated conditions definitely increases if the conditions you're growing it in are, well, are very different from where the restoration site where you may be using them. Uh, so certainly if you, if you are trying to produce seed for a species that grows in very arid environments, you would be best suited to grow, to have your production field in a similarly arid environment, soil type, things that can help you um, keep as many plants alive, but not just select for those that can grow in cultivated conditions. Um, yeah, that's, it's a, it's a, it's definitely a challenge because you want to be able to keep as many plants alive as possible to minimize adaptation to cultivation. Um, but there's also research showing that plants, the seed produced in a field will be different depending on the conditions in that field. So if a field is actually providing some slightly stressful conditions, the, seeds that's, the seed that's produced may actually be more well equipped to survive under similarly stressful conditions. So I guess my, my short answer to that is that it's really important and I think we need more research to really identify when that makes the biggest difference for the ability of the material we're producing to do well in a restoration. Okay, thank you. The next question is from Susan Reinhart, and she asks, for collecting seed of a native selfing grass species, how many plants should be collected from to acquire sufficient genetic diversity for common garden study and development of an empirically based seed transfer zone? So for selfing grass species, just thinking back to the figure showing the number of individuals needed to capture 95% of the most common alleles, um, 30 is needed for an outcrossing individual, 60 would be needed for a selfing individual, um, and that's that's just the most common alleles, most common part, types of genetic diversity. So, you know, the the more the better. But there is no hard and fast rule of thumb that I'm aware of. Okay, great, thanks. Um, 
Matt Keir asks, are wild collected clones that have been kept in cultivation by repeated cloning for more than 10 years before used in seed production still considered to be wild collected? Also a good question. Are wild collected clones? Do you want me to repeat yeah. it? Um, sure, that'd be great. Okay. <laughs> um, are wild collected clones that have been kept in cultivation by repeated cloning for more than 10 years before used in seed production still considered to be wild collected? I could be an annoying researcher and say that we probably need more. It would be really nice to be able to do some genetic work to see if any unwanted mutation has happened in those clones. I think it depends on how you're cloning things and what the life cycle is like. Um, the short answer is it's it's <laughs> I, I don't know the right answer to that. Um, it's probably, it's certainly better than if you had ten generations or even a few generations of reproduction, um, but you could still be getting some unwanted mutation in those clones if you're reproducing them. And, uh, I think I think you're generally okay, um, but in situations like that, if it's still possible to go collect wild material, um, that would be preferable, um, not only because those clones may no longer be adapted to the conditions at the site where you collected them from, if site conditions are changing, as we know that they are, um, if those populations are sort of tracking those changes, adapting to those changes, um, genetic diversity is always kind of a moving target. So the closer you are to what's going on in the field, under natural conditions, the better. But again, I think just having more more studies that helps uh, helps us identify whether or not that's really a, a, a an important point or not would be really useful. Okay, great, thanks. Tova Spector asks, where does the 100 meter separation distance come from to prevent genetic exchange for outcrossing species? That is a good question. So there are there are a number of publications that look at how far pollinators are able to effectively move seed between populations, and that is a massive generalization there. Um, I'm happy to send you the citation that we've used in the paper, or it's in the paper, um, but yeah, it really, it really depends on the species and the pollinator, and there's always a chance that even with the smallest pollinator that doesn't usually go very far, they may, they may move farther than you expect. Um, so the 100 meters is really just a, a minimum rule of thumb, and as you get to know your species better, um, and working with um, pollination biologists to help identify really how far you sh you may want to keep things apart, um, the better. And if you have two species that you know can hybridize that are that share the same pollinator and flower at the same time, then really considering um, having them go having them planted in different fields or at different times. Okay, thank you. Um, Susan Reinhart asks, in collecting Forb seed for a Forb common garden study, should the Forb seed be taken from taxonomically distinct subspecies or varieties or varieties or can seed be collected from the genus level? I think it depends on what your goals for the for the common garden study are um, and also on on how 
solid you think the taxonomy is. Um, and I think probably the, the Forest Service, Service folks who have been doing this more frequently than I have would probably be the best to answer it, but um, I know for what we've worked on, there are certainly enough differences between subspecies or varieties that they can they themselves can be good delineating boundaries for where you may or may not want to move seed. And so if your common garden is intended on identifying differences at the level that is most useful for restoration, then I would I would keep it within a a variety or a subspecies. But again, I think it really depends on the species you're working with. Like Areogonum, I know, is really challenging with its taxonomy and maybe a slightly, you may have a slightly different approach for that. You may actually use a common garden to try to identify which of those varieties kind of hold up when it comes to morphology and genetic diversity. But for other species like um, some of the penstemon varieties, the, the varieties really seem to, seem to hang t well to um, what they look like, and I wouldn't want to mix those in a restoration, and, and so it wouldn't be worth doing in a common garden. Okay, great. Thank you so much. That looks like the last question. Thank you all for your participation. We would greatly appreciate, appreciate it if you would take our three-question survey of this webinar that will appear after the webinar has ended. I will post the recording of this webinar on our Great Basin Fire Science YouTube channel this afternoon, and the link will automatically be sent to you through the GoToWebinar system tomorrow. Our next webinar, Sagebrush Triage, Favorable Climates and Sustaining Big Sagebrush, will take place this Thursday the 11th. If you have further questions regarding this webinar or have requests for future webinars, please email or call me anytime. Th again, thank you so much for your participation today, and thank you so much, Andrea, for your presentation. Thank you. It was great. All right. Have a great day.